glomerular filtration rate is the volume of filtrate that's produced each minute by the glomerulus. When we give a number for glomerular filtration rate, that number includes both of the kidneys. Typically in a healthy kidney or a healthy set of kidneys, the glomerular filtration rate is about 125 milliliters of filtrate per minute being produced. The kidneys very carefully control glomerular filtration rate and the body actually as a whole also very carefully controls glomerular filtration rate uh, because the body needs to balance the rate of urine formation with systemic blood pressure because we can, if we have really great filtration being uh, occurring at the kidneys, that usually comes at a cost to systemic blood pressure. And so the body and the kidneys very carefully work to balance the rate of uh, glomerular filtration. Intrinsic controls, uh, we're also called renal autoregulation is the kidneys influence on maintaining glomerular filtration rate. So intrinsic controls are essentially the kidney being kind of selfish and saying, okay, I'm gonna maintain glomerular filtration rate at a rate that makes me happy. Extrinsic controls are controls that come from elsewhere in the body that are essentially saying, okay, kidney, we get it. You need to be able to filter and process the blood, but we also have to consider systemic blood pressure. So the extrinsic controls have the task of maintaining systemic blood pressure. And so there's this balance between intrinsic and extrinsic controls to maintain glomerular filtration, a, a proper level of glomerular filtration rate or an adequate level of glomerular filtration with systemic blood pressure. Because we see that blood pressure and glomerular filtration rate are inversely proportional. So if we have a high GFR, that's going to promote high urine output. So we're going to be filtering a lot of blood and processing that to form urine. But that comes at a cost to systemic blood pressure. So if we have a high GFR, we, have, we do have a high urine output but that, as I mentioned, comes at a cost to systemic blood pressure, and that might not always be beneficial. A low glomerular filtration rate means a low urine output, but a high systemic blood pressure, or increases to systemic blood pressure. So the intrinsic and extrinsic controls over glomerular filtration rate have to balance urine output with systemic blood pressure. So let's look for a minute at intrinsic controls and renal autoregulation. Renal autoregulation, its overall purpose is to maintain glomerular filtration rate even if other things in the body are changing. So no matter what else is going on in the body, renal autoregulation helps make sure that the, the kidneys and the glomerulus is continuing to produce filtrate and continuing to cleanse the blood as it properly should. Within renal autoregulation, we see two mechanisms at play here. We see what's called the myogenic mechanism and another tongue twisting of uh, another one of the mechanisms that is kind of a tongue twister here is tubuloglomerular feedback. So let's take a look at what both of these are doing here. The myogenic mechanism is a muscle control mechanism where it's a, a mechanism that uses smooth muscle in the glomerulus or smooth muscle of blood vessels uh, serving the glomerulus. Uh, it has regulation over those. So the myogenic mechanism works like this. An increase in blood pressure causes a constriction of the afferent arterioles that are serving the glomerular capillaries because what the kidney is trying to do when systemic blood pressure is high is protect the glomerular capillaries from extremely high blood pressures because they are capillaries and they're delicate and so high blood pressures have a tendency to rupture small thin capillaries and so increases in systemic blood pressure <clears throat> cause the afferent arterioles of those uh, that are serving the glomeruli to constrict and that is going to reduce glomerular filtration, but it will help protect the glomerular capillaries from damage. 
In contrast, low systemic blood pressure causes dilation of the afferent arterioles, which helps promote high blood flow to the glomerular capillaries and increases glomerular filtration rate. So if blood pressure is high, constricting this afferent arteriole will reduce blood flow and pressure to the glomerulus, and it's going to help protect it from damage there. But if blood pressure is low, dilating the afferent arteriole will help keep blood flow to the glomerulus high. It will help maintain high hydrostatic pressure of the glomerular capillaries so that that fluid is continuing to be forced into the glomerular capsule and a normal glomerular filtration rate can be maintained even if systemic blood pressure drops. So if we take a look at the myogenic mechanism here, this is from the perspective of a drop in systemic blood pressure. Drop in systemic blood pressure uh, in the uh, afferent arterial specifically serving the glomerular capillaries will reduce GFR simply because we have less pressure behind that blood, so less driving force behind that blood getting it to move into the glomerular capillaries. The afferent arterials uh, will respond by vasodilating, that is their, their diameter will become much larger and that will increase blood flow to the glomerulus which will increase glomerular filtration rate. So let's take a look now at the tubular glomerular mechanism of autoregulation. I'm glad I was able to say that without stumbling. So let's look at this. So let's go back to that juxtaglomerular complex. This is always a fun little segment because we've got two tongue twisters of words in this little discussion here. So if we return back to the juxtaglomerular complex, which is that cluster of cells and structures that sits between the ascending limb of the nephron loop and the afferent efferent arterioles that are serving our glomerular capillaries. We see that tubular glomerular feedback is controlled by the macula densa cells, which are sodium chloride detectors. And so tubular glomerular feedback is regulated by sodium concentrations in the filtrate to control uh, the rate of filtrate production. So just to remind you again of what we're looking at, this is the juxtaglomerular complex here. This is the ascending limb of a nephron loop that's passing in close proximity here to our afferent efferent arterioles that are serving. So here's the afferent arterial, efferent arterioles here. So blood going to the glomerulus is, is entering through the afferent arterial, making its way through the glomerulus and exiting through the efferent arterial here. So we've got this ascending limb of the nephron loop passing in close proximity to it. The macula densa cells are a small population of cells that line the lumen or the inside of the nephron loop here, and they're measuring sodium chloride concentrations. So when sodium chloride concentrations in the filtrate are high, the afferent arterial here will constrict. So that's going to reduce blood flow to our glomerulus and slow down our glomerular filtration rate. The reason that this occurs is that when what we, what we don't want to happen, or the reason why this occurs, is what we don't want to happen is we don't want to lose too much of the sodium chloride to the urine. So if there's a high concentration of sodium chloride in the urine, it means that filtrate is moving through the renal tubules too quickly and it's not having enough time to absorb the sodium chloride that's in the filtrate. And so by slowing down glomerular filtration rate, we slow down the movement of filtrate through the renal tubules, and that increases the amount of time that the tubules have to absorb, absorb the sodium chloride. So it's helping to make sure that we're not losing an unnecessary amount of sodium and chloride to the urine. When sodium chloride concentrations in the filtrate are low, it means that the filtrate is spending a little too much time in the, uh, in the renal tubules. And so what this will do is tubular glomerular feedback dilates the afferent arterial here. So if we go back there to this diagram, we'll see that this afferent arterial will dilate, which increases blood flow to our glomerulus, and will increase the rate of glomerular filtration. That'll increase our GFR. So that increases our GFR, which means that filtrate is going to be moving through the 
filtrate is going to be moving through the filtrate is going to be produced at a higher volume, a higher quantity per unit time. And that means that that filtrate that's in the tubules is going to be moving much faster. So that's going to serve to decrease our absorption time a little bit. So it's really kind of helping to balance out the sodium chloride concentrations that are that will eventually be lost in the urine. Or if you want to look at it another way, it's balancing the amount of time that the body has to reabsorb the proper amount of sodium and chloride so that we do not lose it to the urine. So again, looking at that flow chart, that diagram here, in the context of a drop in systemic blood pressure, of course we see that a drop in systemic blood pressure decreases our glomerular filtration rate because it decreases the blood pressure in the glomerular capillaries. So that's also going to slow, because the rate of filtrate formation is slower, that means the flow of filtrate through the renal tubules is going to be much slower. And that causes the, uh, that causes the macula densa cells in the juxtaglomerular compact, complex to cause or promote vasodilation of those afferent arterioles here. And so when these afferent arterioles dilate here, we get increased glomerular filtration rate, which is going to help promote, uh, through, through more blood flow getting to the glomerular capillaries, that's gonna help promote more glomerular filtration. So we'll increase glomerular filtration rate with that. If systemic blood pressure were high, uh, this would essentially work in the opposite to, um, uh, to do that as well. So we can look at it from the perspective of high sodium chloride concentrations in the filtrate or high or low systemic blood pressure. So we looked at the intrinsic mechanisms, the renal autoregulation mechanisms. Now let's turn our attention to the extrinsic controls because the extrinsic controls are the other body systems that are regulating GFR. So their job or their purpose is to make sure that systemic blood pressure remains adequate by regulating GFR. So this is essentially the body exerting control over the kidney to say, okay, kidney, you are producing adequate amounts of filtrate. There's other body systems that we have to think about and consider. And those other body systems are dependent on adequate blood pressure. And so the extrinsic controls are serving to maintain adequate systemic blood pressure by increasing or decreasing GFR. We've got two mechanisms that come into play here. We have hormonal mechanisms and neural mechanisms because these are the two uh, organ systems that are controlling body's responses. We have the endocrine system and the nervous system that are controlling these. So let's look at the hormonal extrinsic control mechanism. We actually already saw this one back in the blood vessels chapter when we were talking about regulation of blood pressure. It's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. So it's a series of hormones and enzymes that come into play to regulate blood pressure. It turns out that the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism is the primary way that the body increases blood pressure. So this is the this is the common route by which the body uses to raise systemic blood pressure here. So if we encounter a drop in systemic blood pressure, this section in green here will highlight what's going on in the renal angiotensin aldosterone mechanism here. We see that a drop in systemic blood pressure causes the granular cells of that juxtaglomerular complex to release an enzyme called renin. And renin is an enzyme that converts a plasma protein in the blood. That plasma protein is called angiotensinogen. And renin is an enzyme that converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin II. So renin is released into the blood. Renin being an enzyme works to convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin. Angiotensin then exerts its effects in really kind of two ways here. Uh, the first way here is that angiotensin directly uh, exerts a vasoconstriction effect on systemic arterioles. So angiotensin has the effect of constricting systemic arterioles. 
And during times of low blood pressure, when we constrict systemic arterioles, that decreases the diameter of those blood vessels and raises the blood pressure of the blood that's within them. So that's gonna serve to increase systemic blood pressure. The other way that angiotensin exerts its effect is that angiotensin affects the adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland is a little essentially pyramid-shaped gland that sits like a hat on the superior part of the kidney. It is an endocrine organ, and one of the hormones that it produces and releases is a hormone called aldosterone. So angiotensin is influencing the adrenal gland to release aldosterone. Now aldosterone works its or does its job by uh, promoting sodium reabsorption. So aldosterone has the effect of influencing sodium absorption uh, from the filtrate into the blood. So aldosterone is being released by the adrenal gland here. Aldosterone influences the kidney tubules to reabsorb sodium or promote more sodium reabsorption by the kidney tubules. One of the things to note about sodium reabsorption is that water typically follows where sodium goes. So water and sodium are kind of BFFs. And so anywhere that sodium goes, water is going to follow it. And when water follows, when, when sodium is being, when more sodium is being reabsorbed in the blood, that means that more water is also going to follow that sodium as well. And so water following the sodium into the blood is going to increase blood volume which serves to increase systemic blood pressure as well. So let's turn our attention to the neural controls of maintaining GFR. The sympathetic branch of the nervous system, so the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight division of our nervous system, comes into play when blood pressure is low. So the sympathetic nervous system is activated when blood pressure or when extracellular fluid, that is when tissue fluid is low. What the nervous system will do is it will cause the release of both uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which are two types of neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters exert their effects on systemic blood vessels. And what will happen, particularly in arterioles, systemic arterioles, the small arteries, is that we will get systemic vasoconstriction as uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine are released. So the more epinephrine and norepinephrine that are circulating in the blood, the more systemic vasoconstriction we're going to get, which is going to serve to increase our systemic blood pressure. But epinephrine and norepinephrine inhibit, <clears throat> inhibit the urinary system's ability to do its job. So epinephrine and norepinephrine actually have the opposite effect on the afferent arterioles serving the glomerulus, and they serve to constrict the afferent arterioles, which decreases glomerular filtration rate. So to summarize all of these here, we see the intrinsic controls and the extrinsic controls. Remember, the intrinsic controls are the, the kidney's uh, influence on maintaining its own gl uh, glomerular filtration rate. So renal autoregulation intrinsic controls, they're primarily concerned with maintaining glomerular filtration rate even if there's uh, changes in systemic blood pressure. So the kidneys uh, want to make sure that glomerular filtration rate is maintained at adequate levels, despite what else is going on in the body here. We saw the two mechanisms there, the myogenic and the tubular glomerular feedback, which control glomerular filtration rate. Extrinsic controls serve to make sure that the rest of the body has adequate blood pressure. So extrinsic controls are kind of serving to exert their influence on the kidney so that GFR can either be increased or decreased depending on what the rest of the body needs in terms of systemic blood pressure. We saw two mechanisms there. We saw the hormonal renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism, and we described the the vasoconstriction of arterioles that occurs uh, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated. 
Looking ahead, we'll look at some homeostatic imbalance here, uh, a condition called anuria. So anuria basically means without urine. This is an ab. This describes an abnormally low urine output, which is less than 50 milliliters of urine per day. So recall that a normal urine uh, output is about uh, one and a half liters or 1,500 milliliters per day. So anuria is significant decline, uh, represents a significant decline in urine output here. Uh, anuria could be caused by the fact that the, the blood pressure going to the glomerulus is too low to promote filtration, because remember we saw the, the hydrostatic or the blood pressure is the main driving force of fluid from the glomerular capillaries into the, uh, into the glomerular capsule space. Uh, renal failure uh, and anuria result from conditions where really the nephrons stop functioning correctly. Uh, a couple of examples of where nephrons start to fail in their job are conditions like acute nephritis. So acute nephritis describes inflammation of the nephrons from things like infections. So urinary tract infections, uh, if a urinary tract infection reaches the kidney that can cause nephron inflammation and really inhibit their ability to do their job. Transfusion reaction, or sorry, um, let's back up here and talk about strenuous exercise here. During strenuous exercise, blood pressure, t uh, systemic blood pressure tends to be highly elevated and high long-term elevation of systemic blood pressure can cause inflammation and injury or damage to the nephrons. So that can also result, strenuous exercise can also result in acute uh, nephritis and inflammation at the uh, at the nephrons. Transfusion reactions uh, are also a cause of anuria. So transfusion reactions are when the red blood cells are ruptured and destroyed if you uh, if you transfuse wrong uh, incorrect or incompatible blood types, or any times any type of crush injury uh, where the nephrons are are damaged physically, and so when they're damaged physically, they're unable to do their job. I should back up and mention here that transfusion reactions will promote anuria or will cause anuria because they end up clogging up the, uh, the filtering apparatus at the nephron. So those fragmented red blood cells and proteins cause blockages at the filtration membrane, and so that significantly inhibits the, the nephron's ability to uh, to filter the, the blood and, and create filtrate.